Next, we have Scott Zinke. Uh, since 2001, Scott has been with the Con Connecticut Advanced Pavement Laboratory and the Connecticut Transportation Institute at the University of Connecticut. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm going to give you a, uh, a brief summary of a surface treatment that was uh, developed and trialed here uh, in Connecticut back in the 2012 time frame. Uh, and it was sort of uh, at the time intended to be an option, uh, a paper placed option, um, optional alternative, I should say, uh, to the ultra thin uh, bonded wearing course uh, at the time. So I'll go through a little bit about the um, development of the mix itself, its design, a little bit about the volumetrics. Uh, of the mixture in the laboratory, and then a little bit about its performance and placement, and then ultimately uh, its uh, performance to date. So I'll start with a, a little bit about the, uh, the genesis of the mix and, and why we designed it and what its intention was uh, in the first place. And first it was developed as uh, an additional uh, tool to the you know, toolbox or portfolio, uh, if you will, of pavement preservation treatments uh, in Connecticut. And second, uh, there were a couple primary uh, criteria that needed to be met uh, with this mix. It was desired, first of all, um, to increase the overall friction of the roadway surface with the use, uh, through the use of this mix. And then finally, looking for an alternative to the ultra-thin bonded wearing surface such that it could be placed just with standard paving equipment uh, as opposed to the specialized spray pavers and, and so forth with the ultra-thin. Okay, and so with those criteria in mind, we uh, focused on a few different ways uh, to produce those desired characteristics. Um, and one was to limit the amount of fines uh, in the mix. We're looking to limit the amount of fines simply to open up the texture uh, at the surface uh, to give us a better, you know, tire pavement uh, friction uh, at that interface there, um, but not so open that we had a permeable pavement. We were, weren't looking for uh, a layer of pavement where water would drain vertically through it. Uh, but something just simply to give us a more open texture uh, at the pavement surface. And with a focus on uh, the thinner, you know, thin placement uh, of this mix, we limited it uh, to a maximum of uh, 3 eighths uh, stone size uh, to accommodate that thin placement. Uh, and finally, with also a focus, an intended focus on uh, using a polymer modified uh, asphalt binder just to give us uh, a little bit of added durability. Uh, with the idea, you know, when you move from a, a, a dense graded mix to, let's say, a gap graded uh, or open graded mix, you lose uh, that packing effect or lock-in effect, uh, if you will, of the sand particles around the coarse aggregate particles uh, in the mix that give you uh, a lot of structural stability. So, you know, we, we certainly were looking for a polymer modified uh, binder just to kind of contribute uh, and give us uh, a back a lot of that, you know, that lost stiffness uh, as well as durability. Uh, and as a preservation treatment, you know, we, we, we certainly couldn't ignore, um, you know, surface conditions. We're looking for qu uh, quality surface conditions uh, to place this mix with no, you know, no obvious structural defects and so forth, seal cracks, uh, or, or to bare minimum, you know, repair any structural defects uh, that might be uh, present uh, at the selected location. I'm not sure how clear this is on the screen, but I'll go to, through just a, a couple basic concepts. We played around in the laboratory with this mix uh, quite a bit. Uh, with different gradations, different binder contents, you know, measuring all the volumetrics and so forth. And without boring you to death, I just want to, you know, focus the, the, uh, the emphasis here or the focus to open up uh, that texture to give us those, those high frictional properties uh, was the reduction uh, in fine aggregate. And so you can see we, what we ended up with uh, was this range uh, of, of mixture gradation limiting the fine aggregate to an, uh, a range of no more than 35 uh, to 50 percent of the mix. And again, as far as the, the asphalt binder requirements, back in 2012, uh, the requirement was uh, we, we wanted a, a couple grades uh, stiffer than we typically use, which is a high PG grade of 64. Uh, so we specified the use of a 76 uh, performance grade 76 minus 22 uh, with the requirement that it contained uh, an SBS polymer uh, modifier. And I'm not going to bore you to death with, with volumetrics and so forth in the lab, but these, these were the actual mixture requirements that we came up with uh, through a lot of torture testing and then also volumetric testing uh, in the lab with air voids and, you know, VMAs and, and, and things like that. Um, we stuck to 50 gyrations with this mix. And the reason that we stuck to 50 gyrations was we were concerned with this polymer modifier uh, in the field and being placed at, at one inch, you know. If we went up to 60 or, let's say, perhaps 75 gyrations, what would actually happen, you know, uh, in the field, would we be able to get down to uh, our design of 5% air voids, um, you know, and, and still hang on 
uh, to that minimum of 6% uh, asphalt content uh, and a minimum VMA of 18%. Of, of okay. And so in addition to that, to preclude, because, you know, on a trial basis, to, uh, in an effort to preclude any um, unforeseen problems that, you know, we, just things you might not expect, uh, at least on a trial basis with this mix when we put it down, uh, we also put in requirements of, you know, no wrap, no shingles, uh, no glass, no, basically no recycled products. With the nature of the mix, um, uh, with the uh, elevated asphalt binder content, if you will, along with the, you know, what you're really asking that binder to do, which is it's doing a lot more, uh, a lot more work uh, in a mixture like this with, um, with a lot more coarse aggregate, uh, we were concerned if there was going to be any issues at all uh, with, mo with uh, moisture susceptibility, such as stripping or anything like that, uh, we put in a requirement uh, for moisture-induced damage in accordance with AASHTO T283 uh, simply to, to try to, number one, identify that problem and then be able to deal with it uh, if a problem was identified. So we put in a minimum value uh, for moisture-induced damage. And then with the, uh, the binder film thickness, the elevated binder film thickness uh, on the coarse aggregate uh, as the mix was designed, we were, you know, we're always concerned about uh, things like drain down uh, as well. So we put in a drain down requirement. I believe uh, at the time, I want to say it was three tenths of a percent. Um, it may have been elevated to a, a tenth of a percent higher than that at 25 degrees above production temperature. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but it was in, uh, essentially in that range. And as far as the, the uh, requirements for delivery and, and placement go, uh, we, we put in a requirement for an MTV, a uh, material transfer vehicle. And the primary reason that we put that in there is not necessarily that we were concerned about things like gradation segregation. What we were concerned about uh, really with this mix uh, was temperature segregation. Okay? Um, we had had uh, concerns about temperature segregation uh, in the field, things that we've identified uh, in the past. That specifically, when you get temperature differentials, uh, when you get these cold spots that end up, end up being, you know, undercompacted and so forth, we were then, you know, concerned about uh, elevated air voids and, and perhaps the mixture holding water and so forth, and uh, uh, we didn't want that to happen. So we thought that we might be able to mitigate uh, a lot of those issues with the use of an MTV. And, you know, TAC was obviously required and a final compacted thickness uh, of one inch plus or for this trial, uh, one inch plus or minus uh, a quarter of an inch. And we put in compaction requirements as well, and I believe these are still in the, the current provisional spec. Um, uh, on the project, we needed a minimum uh, of two 10 ton, 10 ton rollers. Uh, at least the first one needed to be operated in vibratory mode uh, with the first three passes. Uh, at a, a minimum of 12 impacts per foot, and then the final two passes in static mode at a speed that didn't exceed uh, six miles an hour. Okay. And the whole idea was that this compactive effort uh, would be completed prior to the paver, uh, excuse me, the pavement reaching, uh, you know, getting down to a temperature uh, of 200 degrees and, and, and less than 200 degrees because um, we were concerned about being able to uh, meet compaction requirements uh, at lower temperatures. This image just kind of shows you uh, the location of the trial section where this was placed uh, on Route 12 in the uh, Preston Ledyard area uh, of Connecticut back in the August, uh, September, uh, you know, late summer uh, 2012 there. There was a 1.63 mile placement uh, of this mix, this thin friction wearing course as it's, as it's termed now. Uh, and that, these orange, the orange highlighted section is where the thin lift was, uh, friction course was put down. And I should mention it doesn't show it on this map, but uh, directly below that, so directly south of that project, placed at the same time, uh, was a dense graded uh, mix that was placed, um, you know, we put things in that order for, so we would have something, you know, similar base conditions, so we'd have a basis for comparison. Uh, later on, we went out and, and evaluated the mix. And so the day after placement, this was paved at night, uh, we went out and we wanted to get an idea uh, of what the uh, surface condition looked like, specifically with respect to the texture. Uh, and so this is, this is the day following placement. So this is, um, you know, taking, uh, uh, you know, observing the, the texture uh, of the surface less than 24 hours after placement. And we were happy to see, you know, pretty much right along the lines of, of what we expected uh, to get. There's a quarter there for, for uh, size reference. I also went, just because I, I wanted to uh, have a comparison slide for purposes of this presentation, I went out a couple weeks ago uh, and I took an image, a uh, close-up image of this, uh, of the surface as well. Uh, and I, I know it's difficult to see given the contrast with the, ex with the exposed aggregates and so forth, but uh, I do want to point out 
that the texture is still there. It, it, the roadway is holding up um, really exceptionally well from a durability standpoint. You can't really see, there are a couple coins in each of these images, but again, given the contrast, you most likely uh, are not able to, to, to observe them. But nonetheless, this is uh, uh, the surface condition uh, just, right about, just over three, uh, two weeks ago. And then also for comparison purposes, this is just a general condition image uh, of that pavement uh, the day after it was placed as well, not, you know, not focusing in on the, uh, uh, on the surface. Uh, but nonetheless, you get a general idea of the condition of the pavement uh, the day after it was placed. And so in the same location uh, two weeks ago, so this is uh, five years and seven months later, in the same location, actually looking in the other direction, uh, you can get a general idea of the condition of the pavement as well. You can see where the, the surface asphalt has worn uh, from those surface aggregates, um, but the, the pavement in general is in, is in uh, exceptionally good uh, condition. And the wearing of that aggregate, uh, I want to point out as well, is something that we expected, and that's going to come into play when I start talking uh, about the friction performance in, in just a minute here. So some uh, general uh, current condition notes. We know that the asphalt has uh, worn from the surface, uh, especially from the coarse aggregates uh, at the surface, which we expected, and that does play, uh, tend to play into uh, increases in friction that I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, there's no cracking. There's no other obvious forms of, of distress or, or you know, uh, obvious areas of any type of failure uh, that we can see at, at, at this point. With respect to comparing um, this thin friction wearing course to the dense graded section that was paved immediately south uh, of that placement. We have, uh, for the first 21 months, we have uh, friction measurements uh, to compare uh, at exactly the same time frame. And again, these, these, this is on the same, set, uh, the same roadway uh, with Termini and the sections. You know, they bought right up to each other, uh, so we have the same uh, base conditions and so forth, uh, so it's a really good basis for comparison. And what you can see is on the, uh, uh, on the blue series there, that is the thin friction uh, wearing course lift. Uh, you can see what happened over the first few months as that asphalt slowly wore away uh, from the, uh, the surface aggregates. We get elevated uh, levels of friction. And over that 21 month period, as the asphalt slowly wore away from those surface aggregates, those friction levels remained high, um, which we were quite happy with. And what you'll notice um, with the ribbed tire, uh, skid uh, performance, you get almost similar behavior. Uh, I'm just going to toggle back and forth so you can kind of see that they pretty much behaved the same uh, with respect to uh, the friction properties. Um, at first, the dense graded uh, rib tire friction performance was, uh, you know, was a lot higher, but you know, over time, again, as that surface asphalt sort of wore away, uh, the, uh, the thin friction caught up from a rib tire perspective. And then finally, uh, I don't have, beyond 21 months, I don't have performance data uh, to compare to the dense graded mix, but I do have just the overall behavior uh, of the friction over uh, the next five, you know, five years, so 60 months after uh, it was placed. You can see uh, in the beginning, the first uh, 20 months or so, um, up to 21 months, uh, as that, that surface asphalt wore away from the surface aggregates, the friction continued to go up and remained fairly elevated uh, over the next five years. Um, you can see that it, it slightly trends down a little bit, and I think you could pretty much expect that with any bituminous surface that uh, with the aggregates as they, they slowly wear, you know, kind of over time and polish a little bit, that you're going to get a, a, maybe a slight drop uh, in friction, but the numbers uh, are still elevated, you know, to the point where, where we're still happy with this. And then I also have the, um, uh, the rib tire uh, performance uh, as well uh, over, um, over 60 months, so five years from the time it was placed uh, up until about six, seven months ago here. Um, and just to, just to go along with that, I don't have uh, any slides that look at uh, texture, but, but I can tell you we did the work. Uh, John Hennel and I went out uh, and we were measuring uh, with the CT track meter, just uh, trying to get a look um, you know, at a comparison from a texture standpoint um, about, uh, I want to say it was 2014, so about three years, uh, two years after uh, the original placement. Uh, and what we noticed, we were still getting mean profile depths well uh, in excess of, you know, twice the mean profile depths that we were getting uh, on the, uh, the dense graded uh, counterpart uh, out there. So. Uh, conclusively to date, um, a couple things that we found that uh, we thought were of note is, number one, the contractor uh, indicated very, and this is anecdotal, uh, but found that the thin friction wearing course was actually easier to produce in place than the ultra thin bonded. And the reason, his reasoning for that, their reasoning for that, uh, I should say, 
uh, is number one, the placement, it's obvious. You can place it with standard paving equipment, so it makes things uh, a little bit simpler from that perspective. Uh, but also the gradation controls on the mix itself were not as stringent uh, as they are with the UltraFin. Uh, so, so that was another, um, uh, another high point from the contractor's perspective. And then from a durability perspective, you know, as I said, I went out there just a, a couple weeks ago, and here we are five and a half years later, uh, and the friction is still, still in, in an elevated condition, uh, and, and the mix looks great. Like I said, there's no cracking, there's no raveling, there's, there's, there's really no um, points of obvious distress out there. And with respect to the thin friction wearing course, that is pretty much all I have to say. I don't know if anybody has any questions. The question had to do with the polymer dosing. I don't know. The, our only requirements as far as the polymer went was that, hey, number one, it had to be SBS mo uh, polymer modified. Uh, that was specified just simply due to any concerns that we might have had with other types of polymer and so forth, uh, and that it had to meet the 76, back then, the 76 minus 22 conditions. Today, I think it's written into the provisional as 64E minus 22. But as far as the polymer dosing, I don't know. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.